All right, we are joined by crew chief of the number four Bush Light Ford Mustang, Rodney Childers. Uh, only made sense to have Rodney on the call with as successful as that Ford team has been at Atlanta Motor Speedway. If you've got a question for Rodney, raise your hand. By all means, we'll get to as many as we can here over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, and why don't we get started with Mark Garrow? Mark, why don't you kick us off? Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, you sound yes. good. All right, I was having problems with audio. Okay. Uh, Rodney, first off, I, I guess I've got a two-part question. Number one, last year you guys were the butt kickers. Now you've kind of been the kickies. Uh, you've been in this a long time and understand the ups and downs of it all. But just what's this season been like? Uh, because you had, you know, on the heels of a, a fantastic 2020. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you can look at it starting back uh, in the fall last year. We started to kind of lose our stride a little bit. And, um, you know, the Hendrick cars got going really good there at the end of the year. And this year we've just kind of been off a little bit all year long, you know, no matter if it's been a, a road course or a 550 race or a 750 race, um, kind of off altogether. So, um, you know, it's definitely been tough. You know, everybody's been working really hard trying to get better. Um, but as you know, too, it's, it's tough to, to start reeling all that back in. You know, you, you head down one road and, and um, you got to try to just keep keep after it and hopefully keep getting better every week. And we've, we've made some gains, you know, but we haven't you know, just been knocking it out of the park uh, as far as catching up. So we, we, we just got to keep working and hopefully get better. And... You know, in that regard, you guys have been so lights out at Atlanta before, as Dan was just talking about. To have, you know, to have, you know, a so-so run, if you have one of those this weekend where you're good, but you're not, you know, at the level you need to be to win. How disappointing is that at a track that you guys know that you're so tuned into? Yeah, Atlanta is one of those places we've been really good at. I think if if you took the, the downforce back off of them and, and gave the – the horsepower back we'd be even better um but you know on the other side of that the 550 stuff we've still been okay you know 2019 we led laps and probably had the best car in the long runs and didn't capitalize at the end of it but um you know in 2020 we weren't great at the beginning kept adjusting on it and got really good at the end so um you know this year this year i think atlanta we just kind of you know missed it a little bit we were we were further off on our cars early in the, in the year than what we thought. And just, um, just a lot of, you know, little things that I probably don't need to get into, but overall, I think, um, our car this weekend should be a little bit better. Um, not going to say that we can just blow the doors off everybody, but hopefully we can, we can run with them and, and have a shot. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks, uh, Mark. Let's go to Michael Knight. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. Rodney, thank you for your time uh, today. I have two questions. Kind of following up on uh, what you were just talking about, when you have a season that is so atypical for what, you know, uh, the expectations are based on past performance over a lot of seasons, what do you do to keep good lines of communication open between yourself and Kevin and also just to keep the entire uh, crew, be it the uh, shop crew or the road crew, uh, up and, and motivated and, uh, you know, not get so down that it, you know, could cause other problems? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing for us is, you know, I, I'm honestly really fortunate to have the people that I have. And, um, you know, they're all very detail-oriented. They, they don't need to be pushed every day to, to try to do their jobs better. Um, they do it on their own. Um, you know, even though we have those meetings and we talk about the race, we talk about the things we could have done better. Um, they don't necessarily need that. They, they just strive to, to be the best every single day. And, um, you know, so that, that part has been fairly easy. Yeah. I mean, we leave the racetrack, we're disappointed. Um, you know, we, we complain about certain things, driving to and from the airport and, and all those things that goes along with our sport and, and, and racing in general. But, you know, overall, we, we still come to the shop. We still try to build the best cars we can. 
uh, we, we still try to get better every single week. And, um, you know, and you, you can look at the pit crew side of things. I, you, know, you look back at 2015 where we had, you know, really lights out cars and, and couldn't get off pit road to save our lives and gave away probably 12 wins that year. Um, and then this year, you know, our pit crew has just saved us over and over and over all year long and have been, have been the lights out part of our team this year. So, um, you know, whether the cars are good or bad, they, those guys have stayed positive. They've worked their butts off and keep trying to be, you know, the best every week and, and same with the guys here in the shop. Okay. And a second question in formula one, uh, every team reaches a point in the season, even the uh, top funded teams like Ferrari and Mercedes, where they admit, admit publicly that they stop development on the car and put all their resources into next year's car, especially as is going to be the case next year. They're going to have uh, major rule changes and obviously NASCAR is going to be uh, wildly different from what it is. Um how much of a uh, – does that kind of thing exist in NASCAR where you would get to a point of trying to find speed in the current car because you need to devote all resources to uh, the next next year's uh, new package? Yeah, I've been asked that quite a few times this year. And, you know, I want to say, yeah, we've, we've put a ton into the next-gen car, and that's the reason that we're off a little bit. But it, it's really not um, – you know, we, we've just got behind on the current car and, and, um, you know, we've, we've lost people and we've lost important people. Um, I think the next gen car is a bit scary for people that have been in the sport for a long time, uh, designers and engineers and, uh, a lot of our aero group and, and different personnel have decided to move on and get out of racing in general. And, you know, that part hurts, um, definitely not, you know, pointing fingers saying that that's the reason that we're running bad because we were running bad before they left. So I'm just saying that it, it makes it harder to catch up. Um, you know, the limited wind tunnel time, um, the limited CFD time, all those things, um, you know, have hurt us. You know, I think the Stuart Haas racing in general has always been probably the leader in the garage of using wind tunnel time. And, and um, that's one of the reasons that we've run good over the years. And, now that all that's gone, it, it makes it really tough for us to catch up and, and to, to do the things that we need to do. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a tough sport. And, you know, you've seen it over the years that, you know, when, when a, you know, a company or a manufacturer gets ahead, it's hard for the others to, to catch up. So hopefully we can keep, you know, getting better, like I said earlier, and, and uh, have some strong runs here in the second half of the year. Thank you for your time, Rodney, and thank you, Dan. Thank you, Michael. Let's go to Nate Ryan, NBC. Go ahead, Nate. Thanks, Dan. Hey, uh, Rodney, um, it was two months ago that you told us that you were down about 70 counts of rear downforce. Uh, i just curious, like, wh where are you guys in terms of regaining that? Do you have, like, a ballpark figure? Have you gotten some of that back? And just the, the state of Stuart Haas racing generally from an aerodynamic standpoint, have, have things improved from late April? Yeah, it's crazy how that works, you know, and that remark back then was compared to last year when we were the best and, you know, everybody in the field lost some downforce and, um, you know, I think some lost 30 counts, some lost 45 counts and some lost 70 counts and I think the 70 counts was Stuart Haas, so um, that part sucks, but overall, um, you know, it, it is what it is, right? So, you know, our goal is to work through that and to try to get better and, um. I wish I could tell you that we have more downforce than the beginning of the year, but we really don't. We probably lost some from the beginning of the year because every, you know, every week that you go through tech, there's something else, you know, that uh, is going on throughout the, the garage that, you know, and, and Jay has sent out the comms and say, well, all right, well, we're not going to do this anymore and we're going to check this differently and we're going to do this. And um, those things just keep adding up. So, you know, one week you might find something that, that adds seven or eight counts of downforce. And then, then the next week you're fixing something that loses seven or eight counts of downforce. So, you know, compared to the field, it's hard, it's hard to say where we're at. Um, you know, you really don't know that, that question or that answer. And, um, 
but you know all we can do is compare to ourselves and we think that we're going in the right direction we think that um, you know maybe some of the direction that we were going the first half of the year was the wrong direction and um, now we're going back the other direction and I felt like we had a lot better cars at Nashville and hopefully um, and at Pocono I thought we had a decent car there and you know track position was everything but once we got up there we had a really good car and uh, you know, hopefully we'll see this weekend what we have in Atlanta. And after uh, Nashville, Rodney, uh, I believe uh, Cliff Daniels said that they weren't going to build another car for Kyle Larson. So uh, in your position, like as a team that's improving like or trying to improve, like are you guys going to are you still building cars for this year? Or, you know, given that you have a, a car that whose life cycle should be about three or four more months. And if, if you aren't building as many cars, does that limit your ability to kind of keep improving through the development cycles? Um, for us, you know, it's it's not necessarily building new cars, right? So, I mean, you know, the center cage is what it is. Um, you know, every three races, our cars get new front clips and new rear clips. Um, you know, the bodies get, you know, cut off completely. So so when you're talking about new cars, then, yeah, I mean, you're, you're still going to cut bodies off. You're still going to start, start over and, um, and go race those cars the second half of the year. So, um, you know, some of that is track dependent, you know, with the 550 package, you have so many different types of tracks, you know, the car that you run at Michigan, you wouldn't run at Charlotte and the car you run at Charlotte, you wouldn't run at Atlanta. So, um, you know, so you, you kind of have to do that no matter what, um, you have to cut the bodies off and start over. So, yeah, we'll, we'll keep doing the things that we've always done. You know, every year we've done the same things, um, and, you know, prepare ourselves for the playoffs and, and try to be ready and, and do the things that we can to, to do that. So uh, we'll keep we'll keep working and um, and trying to get it better. And one, one quick follow up. When you, you mentioned you guys lost some arrow people, was it a significant number? Was it just a handful? Or? Well, I think everybody has throughout the sport. Um, you know, everybody I, I've talked to from different teams and different crew chiefs, they I think we're all losing a lot of people, but on the other side of it, you know, they probably see the writing on the wall, right? I mean, if you feel like that the the next gen car is going to cut a lot of people out of their jobs, then then you don't want to be the last one standing looking for a job. You want to be the first guy out there finding something. So, um, you know, and and the rest of it is just you know the designers they want to design stuff. Then the next gen car, you can't design stuff. You can't change anything. And, if you if you spent half your life going to school to be a designer, you want to want to use it, right? So, some of that is just that you know it's not that they don't want to work work for Stuart Haas Racing anymore. They just don't want to, you know, they, they want to design things and and you know uh, use the brains on on aero stuff, whether it's you know building airplanes or what it is. So, um, you know, that's, that's just part of it, I think. I don't think it's necessarily just us. I think it's all throughout the sport. Gotcha. Thanks, Rodney. Good luck, Atlanta. Thank you. All right, let's go to Woody King. Go ahead, Woody. Hey, Rodney, appreciate your time. Um, I'm curious about the, the dynamic of your competition meetings. You mentioned you felt like maybe you guys had gone down the wrong path a little bit earlier, and now maybe we're going back that other way. But like when you guys have been the, the flagship of the organization winning the championship, and then you've got a couple of really young guys on the team, what is it like to say, man, we're, we're not sure either which way to go? How is, how is that dynamic working among you guys? Well, I think you go through different things throughout your career. And like somebody said earlier, I've been around long enough to see this over and over. Um, you know, 2006 to 2007 at, at Everham, you can, you can replay this exact uh, situation and um, you know we went through three quarters of the year in 07 and, and Ray got us in a room and told us we could build the cars however we wanted instead of listening to how the aero group wanted to build them and and uh, we had run 25th the whole year and we went the next race after we built a new car and we run fourth so um, you know those things have happened for years and years and years and you know the thing that you you kind of got to keep um I don't even know how to say it, but you don't want to stir the pot too much. You know, you, you got to keep everybody pulling on the same rope and working in the same direction. Um, so you can't just come in one day and piss everybody off and think that you're going to 
fix everything because that's not going to fix it either. So, um, you know, it, it's careful steps of, uh, you know, small changes every week, you know, trying to head back in the direction that you feel is right. And, and um, you know, hopefully those results um, kind of speak for themselves and, and just, you know, move forward from that. Thank you, Ronnie. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you, Woody. Let's go to David Smith. Go ahead, David. Hey, Rodney. Uh, in recent seasons, uh, come playoff time, you had already banked uh, a number of wins, a number of playoff points, and that informed a lot of your pit strategy. Uh, you, you didn't really care much. If you weren't going to win a stage, you didn't mind pitting and getting the track position. This year, it's going to be a little bit different. How do you see that affecting your pit strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think when the playoffs start, it's it's definitely going to be different racing for us, right? Um, I, I told Kevin this before he started the race at Kansas the morning of the race, and he said, what do you think today is going to go like? And I said, well, you're going to have to race differently than you've ever raced. Like, you're going to have to race like Kyle Busch did last year, and you're going to have to fight for every position all day long, and hopefully that you're in the top five somewhere at the end of the day to where you can capitalize on something. And he went out there that day and he fought and clawed all day long. And at the end of the day, you know, Kyle wins the race and we finish second. And and that's really what it's about. Like neither one of us had the fastest cars at Kansas, but we, we sat there and, and, you know, did the right things. We had good pit stops. We had, um, you know, all that going for us. So it's the same thing, you know, when the playoffs start this year. Um, yeah, we're probably going to have to, you know, get stage points and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, I think the, the thing to look at, too, is not a lot of races left in the playoffs are races where you're going to, uh, you know, pit early and, and do all those things. Uh, and you got the Roval in there. But, you know, overall, we – it's it's going to be about having fast cars, right, and having the best engines and doing all those things and being, being fast. And – you know, if you can't go out there and lead laps and win stages and, and uh, you know, be in that top five in, in every stage and getting those points, then, man, you don't hardly deserve to move on anyway, right? So, um, you know, for us, we want to win. Uh, we want to go out there and compete and, and uh, get back to where we used to be. Thank you. All right, thank you, David. Let's go to Kelly Crandall. Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry about that. Um, thanks, Dan. Ronnie, given all that you've been talking about with performance, is there areas where you think you guys can find things? Can you make this better or with the rules the way that they are? Is it kind of just one of those seasons where it's okay, this is what we've got. We've got to make the best of it. My honest answer is it, it kind of is what it is at this point. Um, you know, you don't have many races left before the playoffs, right? Um, you know, we, we'll probably go the wind tunnel two more times before the playoffs start, uh, maybe three times. Um, you know, so from a car side, we're, we're not really going to make the cars much better than, than where they're at, you know, this weekend at Atlanta. Uh, from the engine side, those guys have been locked up all year long. You know, they, they had to submit all their parts going into this year and, they can't change all the things that we've been able to change in years past to, to be able to, to find more horsepower either. So when you can't find more horsepower and you can't find more downforce, it puts you in a tight box. And, um, you know, that, those are the things that I think all of us are sitting here thinking and talking about. It's like you're just going to have to race differently and not make mistakes and, and do, um, you know, be good on pit road and, and do those things. And hopefully you can make it through the next round, but it's going to be tough. Thank you. Bob Pockress, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, Rodney, uh, I don't know if you saw, but Atlanta announced that they're going to repave after uh, the race this weekend. They're going to change the banking and the turns to 28 degrees and narrow the track a little bit. I'm curious if you have any idea what that would do to the racing and uh, what are your general thoughts on it? Thank you. Well, my opinion is it's going to make the racing horrible and it's going to be one lane and nobody's going to pass anybody. 
Um, but you know, that, that, that part sucks, but, uh, Atlanta is one of the last racetracks that we have with a surface like that, uh, that you can run up against the fence or you can run on the bottom. You can run through the middle one and two. You had so many options and, um, you know, even though it was a racetrack that had so many options and, and, um, what old school racers would call, you know, good racing. A lot of people thought that those races down there became boring because the runs are really long. They get spread out. The cars that are good on long runs just, you know, drive away from the field and, and all those things. So, yeah, I mean, new pavement, um, you know, the next gen car with having less downforce, I mean, you're going to run wide open all the way around. It's going to be like racing to Talladega and, um, you know, you'll be drafting a lot and, uh, kind of be, you know, kind of become a speedway race in a way. So, you know, the cars uh, will stay tightly packed together, probably more wrecks and, and all those things that it seems everybody wants to see these, these days. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the way I see it. If, if you put more banking in it and make it narrower, it's going to be one lane. And, you know, it's kind of how the new asphalt tracks are anyway. And, and NASCAR is doing a friction test this week in hopes of maybe when they go back and if when they check it post repave that hopefully Goodyear could match a tire for it. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I see your reaction, but like, I mean, how much of it would depend on like tire and probably development of the next gen car? Um, that's a tough one, honestly. I mean, I, I think the car is going to be so much different. I don't know how you could even use any of that. Um, you know, a friction test now versus then is, is not really going to matter at all. Um, you know, you can't make new asphalt like old asphalt. Um, they don't even make it that way anymore. So, um, you can't buy it that way. You can't make it that way. There's things that they won't allow, you know, EPA won't allow you to put in it that way anymore. So, I mean, there's just, there's no, there's no real comparison at all. So, um, you really just have to, to pave it and and let it weather over the years and um and then the next part of it's just going to be that car right i mean we have to as a group we have to figure out how does that car race um how do we put on the best show uh, for the fans which is our goal and um what changes need to be made over the next couple of years to make that racing better and uh, you know the, all of that we're going to have to learn together and and figure out so um you know, we we'll just have to see, you know, how the racetrack turns out and, and uh, you know, kind of go from there. Thank you. All right, Rodney, we've got two more questioners here. So let's uh, finish up here. Let's start with Tucker White. Go ahead, Tucker. Uh, Rodney, going to another track that also has a very old surface, but you know, with looking down the road to Charlotte Motor Speedway, we've seen that I believe it's now 15 or 16 years we're on this surface, and yet it still looks like it's been – it was just repaved just a few days ago. And so given that other tracks we see, we don't see this anywhere out. What kind of tire fall do you see at Charlotte, like compared to another track like Atlanta? Well, I mean, I think Charlotte is a little bit disguised, right? I mean, we keep spraying stuff on it and running the, the track, you know, the, the tire dragging around there. And so, you know, when you think about that, you think about a drag strip, right? So, you know, does a drag strip really weather over the years? Um, the only places that it weathers are the places where it's not treated, um, you know, where the sun can actually beat up on it. So, you know, now, you know, we've gone on what five years of, of uh, spray in Charlotte and keeping it covered with a, a big, you know, layer of rubber, basically it, it, it's like an insulator. It keeps it from, from weathering throughout the years. And, I think I heard Dell Jr. say that on a, on one of the uh, things that he was talking about or, or an NBC call or something like that, that, you know, Texas is the same way now. You pull into Texas and the track is white, except for where we've been putting that stuff. And, you know, if we would have never put that stuff there to begin with, the track would be moving up the racetrack by now. Um, you would have that second, third groove and you, know, you would start out the weekend on the bottom. Uh, the bottom would get rubbered up, and then you would start finding clean racetrack because clean racetrack has more grip. Well, now that we've been doing these racetracks like this, it has made everything completely like the opposite. And, 
um, you know, your tracks aren't weathering in the, the, the same way that we've seen them, you know, over all the years, it, it's just not going to happen. So um, it's kind of put us in a tough spot. Like it may have fixed something for a couple of years, but now it's not going to fix something in years to come. Um, so I think, you know, we have to figure out how to fix that and, and make that better. And, and, you know, whether these, you know, when these tracks get, get old and we got to quit putting stuff on them basically and, and let people find the gray, you know, those are the things that you heard over the years is, you know, a guy keeps hunting the gray or well, the gray is just where, you know, there's no rubber down and you have that clean racetrack. You think about Fontana over the years, um, you know, when we used to fight to be the first one on the racetrack because whoever was fastest in qualifying got to go out last and um, whoever was fastest in practice got to go out um, last and qualifying. So, um, you know, we would unload off the hauler at Fontana and run a second faster than what we would qualify. And that was just because it was a clean racetrack. It was, uh, you know, had a lot of you know, surface to it, I guess you could say a lot of texture to it. And then during the weekend, that texture gets filled up with rubber. And, and as that happens, you lose grip. So, you know, we have to, we have to figure out how to make all that happen again, basically as a, as a sport, we have to figure out how to make sure these racetracks do that. And, you know, like you said, you know, Charlotte hasn't changed a lot, but you look at Darlington, which was paved about the same time Charlotte was, and man, it's wore out again. And, puts on good racing and wears the tires out. So I think all of us, you know, as a sport, we had to figure out what were the two differences between the paving jobs and who did them and, and how can we duplicate that? All right. Thank you. All right. Let's close it out today with Dustin Long. Go ahead, Dusty. Hey, Rodney. Um, I think you and Paul might be about the only crew chiefs with racing experience, at least at the cup level. Um, as, as you see the sport change, and obviously I know the tires change a lot. That's a, a big technical thing. We're seeing, you know, these changes like today with the announcement with Atlanta, with the tracks and other, all sorts of new tracks coming on. Do you see the industry going away from uh, potential people, uh, former drivers and, and maybe, you know, lower series to be crew chiefs and focusing more on engineering because of so much is changing in the sport right now? Well, honestly, I think that's, that's half the problem with the sport right now. That's what got us in the position that we're in is we all went that direction, you know, seven, eight years ago and have got us into this spot to where, um, you know, it's all engineer driven at this point. Um, you know, we, we, tech the cars down to 10 thousandths of an inch at this point. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to race like that. It's hard for people to, um, you know, you, that's, that's kind of why you, you'll end up seeing, you know, one team and one manufacturer win so many races, whether that was us last year or HMS this year, like, um, it just, it's kind of the box that we're all in at this point. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think you still got to have the old school racer mentality somewhere within your team, you know, whether it's uh, a guy in the shop that makes sure that, that things stay running. Um, you know, we have old man here and he, he don't miss a whole lot and um, has a ton of, of knowledge and experience. But um, it's hard to say what the new cars are going to be like. You know, you have a, a 50 minute practice and the cars are going to be hard to work on or you're not going to have any practice at all and you're just going to qualify and you have to make adjustments during qualify to get ready to race. And, you know, all those things, um, you know, you're not going to have time to go sit in the hauler and run simulation for 10 minutes and figure out what you're going to do. You're going to have to change springs. You're going to have to, you know, work on your bars and do all those things to, to figure it out in a hurry. So. Um, I don't know. I, I think I could see it both ways, Dustin. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it works for some places and it doesn't for others. And, uh, I still think that there's a, a fine mixture of, of both. Um, you know, if I had a four car team of my own, I think I would have two engineers as crew chiefs and two, two racers as crew chiefs. And, um, and I think that that would keep the, the ship steered in the right direction the most and, and not have to you know, fight back and forth on what's right and what's wrong. Also, uh, I'm curious, uh, 
the last few weeks you've had listed as as the engineer for the team at the, on the, at the track as Steven, as opposed to had been Dex in the past. What led to the change, or what's kind of the the adjustments that you guys are doing there with with that uh, with that situation? Yeah, I own a place down at Durhamtown Off Road Park in Georgia, and Dax went with me to Durhamtown Off Road Park to ride dirt bikes, and he decided to do something dumb and broke five ribs, collapsed his lung, had a bleeding spleen, and spent 11 days in the hospital. So Steve decided to take his place for a little while until Dax can actually pick up anything at all. So he's uh, he's doing better, though. He's been working from the shop. And uh, as you know, Dax has been around me for a long time and, and good friends. So I hate that happened to him. But, um, you know, the old saying, if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. and um yeah he uh he's getting better he'll be back at atlanta this weekend thank you all right thanks uh rodney for taking some time and for joining us here and uh, best of luck this weekend in atlanta thank you yeah thank you guys appreciate it thank you